where do we go from here? As I've said in the prayer and uh, in, in speaking with a lot of people over the last number of days and weeks, the world is in kind of a topsy-turvy mode and uh, like I said, I, I think things are still going to get worse before, well, I don't know that they ever will get better, but regardless of that, God's in control. Um, I was talking to uh, Pastor Janet on Friday evening and uh, in one other line of her work, she was saying that she was reading, um, I believe it was a, an economist report, and they feel that it's going to be at least 10 years before Alberta recovers to the position that it was prior to all this happening. And I'm thinking with uh, the hit we have taken in six months, what are we going to do for the next nine and a half years? Like, that's crazy. But there again, God is in control. So, where do we go from here? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Oh, by the way, for those of you who caught my sermon, what was it, three weeks ago, we covered half the Bible, and today we're going to cover the other half. So, uh, hope your uh, writing arm and your uh, listening ears are in good shape, because uh, you're going to need them. Ah, Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. In Genesis chapter 3, we have the account of Satan entering the scene and causing Adam and Eve to sin, and God setting the parameters for life from then on. He cursed the serpent. He announced judgment on woman, that she would have pain in childbirth and be under the authority of a man. Man was sentenced to a lifetime of work and then death. Creation itself was also cursed. In Romans 18, or Romans 8, 18 to 22, we read, Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. When Satan fell, the battle began. Ever since then, that battle is going on. In this battle, Satan has freedom to roam over the earth. Job 1.8 Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. He is the ruler of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Luke chapter 4, verse 5, or 5 to 7 then the devil took Jesus up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Ephesians 6.12 For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Ever since the battle to win mankind started, both God and Satan have set out their battle plans. God wants to have mankind come back to him and spend eternity in heaven with him. He knows that humanity is separated from him, but God, in his love, has made a way to get back into fellowship with him. John 3, 16 and 17, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Romans 5, 8, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Satan, who wants the worship and following of the human race, knows that since sin has entered the entire human race and sin separates us from God, he already has mankind on their way to hell. He is doing all he can to keep people deceived into thinking they are right in living life for themselves. John 8.44 shows us Satan is fully qualified to do that. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar, the father of lies. 
The two sides are presenting their cases and mankind is left in the middle to make a choice. That choice is either to do nothing and stay separated from God and therefore spend eternity with Satan or choose to admit they are a sinner and ask God to forgive them, therefore being reunited back to God, meaning spending eternity with God in heaven. If you choose to follow God, he has set out some parameters for us to live in. He gave us the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 20. Number one, you must not have any other God but me. Number two, you must not make for yourself any idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. You heard anybody do that lately? It's pretty hard not to. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Here's a question for you. How many of us actually give God his day more than just a couple of hours? Number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, you must not murder. In 2017, and that's the last year that I could find numbers for, the UN estimates that there were Take a guess how many murders around the world. 464,000 murders around the world. That's more than all the wars and all the acts of terrorism combined. In Canada, 34% of murders were create, committed by an acquaintance. 33% by a family member. 19% by a stranger, 8% by a criminal relationship, and 6% by someone in an intimate relationship. If you do the math, 73% of murders were created by someone people knew and loved. That's crazy. Choose your friends wisely. Choose your family more wisely, I guess. You must not commit adultery. Number eight, you must not steal. Last year in Canada, it was estimated that five billion, with a B, billion dollars of cargo thefts occurred. Two that I read about, um, $100,000 worth of blueberries were stolen in Hamilton. And there was a load of shoes, and they start with a B. I don't think it was Birkenstock, but maybe it was, but whatever. $465,000 worth of shoes in one shipment, but $5 billion worth of cargo thefts. Crazy. In 2017 in Canada, 85,000 vehicles were stolen. In 2018, the top 10 scams cost Canadians 100 million dollars. So much for not stealing. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. Plain words, don't lie. And you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Don't set your heart on anything that is your neighbor's. While Jesus was on earth doing his ministry, he was tested by the religious establishment. We read in Matthew 22, 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. All of the original Ten Commandments are now covered by just these two. So how is the world doing living up to God's rules? Not very good, I would say. God cannot be in the presence of sin because he is holy. He will also not allow Satan free reign forever. Back in Genesis 3, when God pronounced judgment against the serpent, both physical snakes and Satan, he said that the offspring of woman, that is the human race and Jesus, 
will do battle. Both will do battle with serpents. In verse 15, it says, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To this day, when snakes attack humans, it is generally a blow to the lower body because snakes are on the ground. These attacks can be fatal, although not always. But when a human crushes a snake's head, it is fatal to the snake. Satan did attack Jesus, trying to defeat him by getting him crucified on the cross. But it was only a temporary blow to our Savior as Jesus rose again and defeated both death and Satan. Romans 16.20 writes, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. God does have a timetable to crush Satan, and time is running out. I don't know when that will occur, but we are one day closer than we were yesterday. Matthew 24.36, However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. We don't know, nor can we know, when Christ will return, but we have been given some signs to keep our eyes peeled for, things which must occur and which will be in play before the end can come. Here are a few, Second Peter 3, 3 and 4. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last day, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Luke 21, 25, and 26, and there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And here on earth the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. I've read those verses many times, and um, when I read it, in the last few weeks when I started preparing for this sermon, when we talked about roaring seas and strange tides, does the word tsunami mean anything? How many of these things have you seen happening in our world today? Several months ago, right when COVID-19 hit, I was talking to my sister and she asked if I believed that this was the beginning of the end. Well, this could be the beginning of the end. When we see all of the sin that is going on in the world and seeing those as signs of the end, couple that with the financial fiasco that is going on around the world, who knows? Now, more than ever, we need to li live the Christian life. What does that look like? How do we live the Christian life today? The first thing we must, must do is live the Christian life by faith. Romans 1.17, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Galatians 3.11, so it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Romans 14.23, and this is taken out of the NIV, Everything that does not come from faith is sin. By the way, I forgot to mention all the other scriptures are from the NLT. Why is faith important in the Christian life? We need to take God at his word that he will forgive us if we ask for it. We need faith to believe that God is working in our lives on a second-by-second -second basis. 
Romans 4, 12, and 13, And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. Even after we ask forgiveness from God for the sin in our lives and receive this forgiveness by faith, we still do sometimes sin. God discerns our heart's motives, as this is where sin starts. Matthew 12, 34, you brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. Proverbs 21, 2, people may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their heart. Luke 6.45, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. John Piper, author, teacher, and pastor, is quoted as saying, anything, absolutely any act or attitude which is owing to a lack of trust in God is sin. No matter how moral it may appear to men, God looks at the heart. I'm going to read that again. I know, uh, oh, there it is. If you want to pull out your click, click and take a picture of it so you don't write so fast or that fast, feel free. Anything, absolutely any act or attitude which is owing to a lack of trust in God, is sin. No matter how moral it may appear to men, God looks at the heart. The next thing you need to do is get wisdom. I'm going to give you three references which give us a clear picture of what needs to be done. For the record, there are over 100 verses about wisdom in Scripture, and at least 25 of them are found in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 3 to 9. For I, too, was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, take my words to heart, follow my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom, develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do, and, and whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will place a lovely wreath on your head. She will present you with a beautiful crown. James 1 verse 5, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. 2 Timothy 2.15, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not to need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Wisdom comes by God's blessing and your hard work. You need to study. Coincidentally, the book of Proverbs is chock full of a lot of wisdom. And here is one example. One of the things wise people know is don't borrow. When you borrow, you are a slave to someone else. Proverbs 22, 7. Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Romans 13, 8. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. Canada's national debt is approximately 1.1 trillion, with a T, dollars, and growing. Canada's population is 38 million, meaning that every man, woman, and child owes $29,000 in federal debt. Be before COVID hit, so only six months ago, it was only 20,500. That's nearly a 50% increase in six months. Add in our provincial debt, here in Alberta, that's $86 billion. Divide that between 4.4 million people, it's another $19,500 that we owe in provincial debt. 
I couldn't find any stats on our municipal debt, but I'm sure there is some. And the Canadian average for consumer debt, no mortgage, just consumer debt, is another $29,000. So how much do you owe? The average Albertan basically owes over $75,000 without a mortgage. You tack a mortgage on top of that. We all need to live within our means. Financial experts tell us we should have enough money to pay all of our bills for six months in an emergency fund. Did you notice how quickly people got in trouble when COVID-19 hit? Less than 30 days. All of these government programs have allowed people to live irresponsibly and the taxpayer gets to foot the bill. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Proverbs 22:27. if you can't pay it back, even your bed will be snatched from under you. When you have wisdom, which is based on your faith in God, that's how you live life. One of the necessary things you need next is to get into a small group. The reason for this is that it's God's instituted plan. Man was not meant to fly solo through life. Shortly after God created Adam, he looked and saw that it was not good. Genesis 2.18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. God made a helper for man, that was Eve at that time. He told them to be fruitful and multiply, to create a family. That was the first small group. As we go through life, we need a small group because small groups fill in the blanks where individuals are incomplete. Small groups give fellowship, deep and meaningful relationships, and friendships and help in time of need. Proverbs 18.24, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 27.10, never abandon a friend, either yours or your father's. When disaster strikes, you won't have to ask your brother for assistance. It's better to go to a neighbor than to a brother who lives far away. You don't want too many friends. Remember Canada's murder statistics. You just want a few good ones. Small groups give support in several ways. The first is physical. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. The second is emotional. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. The third is wisdom. Proverbs 12.15 Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. The fourth is mental. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. The fifth is prayer. Galatians 6, 2. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. And the sixth, small groups also provide accountability. Hebrews 3.13 you must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. When you've done what you can do in your faith journey, meaning that you've asked God into your life by faith, that you've studied to learn all that you can, that you've surrounded yourself with quality people to help you live life, there is still one thing left to do. Trust God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which way or which path to take. 
You accepted Christ by faith, believing that you are a sinner and the only way to be saved is by accepting the forgiveness that God is offering you. If you believe he has saved you, then you have to believe that he has a plan for you and your life and is walking with you every step of the way. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Philippians 1, verse 6, I am, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. In light of all that is going on all around us in the world today, the rampant sin, increasing debt levels, social unrest, war, famine, COVID-19, disastrous acts in nature, and many other things, it is easy to see that the world is in a state of turmoil. Thus far, here in Canada, we have been fairly isolated from a lot of the problems seen in the rest of the world. But we have not been immune. Sin is still running rampant. People live for themselves in a state of selfishness, so debt loads mount. We also see corruptions in many levels of leadership in this country, which also creates a destabilizing factor. While we personally may not have been affected by things which are causing grief in our country, we have no guarantee that this will continue. The Bible tells us that as the end draws near, things will get worse. And as I said before, we are not immune. But as we continue to live for God in the way he intended us to live, there will be one thing for certain at the end of this all. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. James 1, verse 12, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So keep living life. Get all the help and support that you can. And trust God that he will work in and through you for his honor and his glory. To live the Christian life is no different today than it was 10 months or 10 years ago. We still need faith to start this journey and to live daily. We need wisdom, we need support, and we need to trust God. The only difference today is that we need to be more intentional about our walk. The job is getting harder. God's mandate, his message, and his methods are all still the same. God is the creator of the universe, and he wants his creation to be with him. Accepting Jesus Christ's payment for our sin is the only way to be reunited to God and human beings are still the conduit of showing God's love and care to the world. Dig deeper. Trust God that he is still in control, and let God work in and through you. We have no idea what tomorrow holds, but we do know who holds tomorrow. Father, we thank you for these words today. We know the world is in an unrestful position. We know that Satan is running amok and causing lots of havoc. But we also know that he's not doing anything that you aren't allowing because ultimately you are working your plans towards your end and he is only doing what you need him to do to bring that about father i believe that we're going to experience some harder times in the coming days but you're going to be there with us as you've already been there you know exactly what's going to occur 
And Father, I just ask that out of your grace and out of your mercy, that you go with us, that you give us the strength that we need to bear up each and every day. And through it all, that we will be the witnesses that you require to show the world that you exist and that you love the world and that you want to save the world. Father, we are your hands and feet and we thank you for that opportunity to serve you and to serve alongside you. As we go out this week, I just pray that you would give us courage. We hear tons of bad news each and every day but that doesn't matter. You're bigger than all the bad news. And Father, we just commit ourselves into your care. Use us for your honor. Use us for your glory. And continue to draw each and every one of us closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed as per... Uh, each and every other time I preach, if anyone needs prayer, wants prayer, needs to talk, I'm available. Uh, other than that, go and have a good and godly week. Feel free to visit outside. Do what you got to do. Have a good week.